Amen. Thank you to Mark and the Blue Group. I say that because we all were back in the green room there, and I was wearing blue, and they were wearing blue, and everybody was wearing blue, and we didn't plan it. So maybe they did, I didn't. But a uh, beautiful song with a beautiful message. Thank you uh, for that. I'm glad you're here today. Are you glad to be here? Yes. We've been singing and praising God together, and we need it every week, don't we? Yes. We need the encouragement. We need the, the blessing. We need the music. It's the, that music that comes back to me in times when I most need it. How about you? Those songs, Love Lifted Me. We need those songs. There's room at the cross for you. It just seems like just at the right time, our memories and our memories of Jesus are so connected with music that we need that melodic word to encourage us just when we need it most. So, today I have a message that I was fascinated as I was studying it. It, uh, it brings in history and a little mystery. And it comes from God's word and I'm excited to share it with you. It has to do with seafaring and the sea and what the symbolism of the sea is in, in Scripture. And did you know the most terrifying thing in the first century to the Roman world was deep water? Did you know that? We'll talk about that. But before we dig in, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. It's our desire to know Him better because we know that by seeing Him, we see you the infinite, wonderful creator of the universe, the one who spoke it all into creation. When Jesus came, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So Lord, we want to see your face through Jesus today. So open up your word to us. Send us your Holy Spirit to guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everybody say, amen. Usually, the, the mysteries of the Bible are only mysteries because... They're speaking in terms that we don't speak in anymore. You know, the Bible was written somewhere around 2,000 years ago, many parts of it. And uh, so they use terms and concepts that are unfamiliar to us. And so one of those concepts has to do with deep water and the sea. It meant something to them back then. Uh, but the mysteries are wonderful. I love them because they present a history lesson. I love to go back into history and read through the Bible and connect Scripture to Scripture, getting my mindset locked in with what they may have been thinking back then for why God chose the language that He chose in different parts of Scripture. It's so important. You know, the, first, the three most fundamental principles to understanding the Bible is, number one, what does it say? Some of those words are hard to understand. And sometimes they, what they mean today is not what they meant back then. That's the first principle of good biblical interpretation. The second is, what did it mean to the people that it was written to? One of the big mistakes that we make when we read the Bible is we automatically say, well, what does this mean to me? Well, that's okay at some times, but if we really want to dig in and understand what Scripture is teaching us, then we need to understand first what it meant to the person that was actually putting pen to paper. Are you following me on that? And then, now, once I know what it says, and now I know what it meant to the person it was written to, now I can take those concepts and those principles and those truths and go, oh, now I know what this means to me. You following that? It's an important concept to understand. And, and this word, this concept that we're going to go through today, I think is fun, interesting, and a doozy. It's a good one. It's a good one. When we study ancient Roman culture, religion, and travel, we understand that the sea and deep water in general was one of the most terrifying things to the Roman world. Think about that for a minute. We take it for granted, don't we? We have submarines. We have diving gear. We have ships that can go from continent to continent. Some of you, I know, love cruises. You're on those boats and they're huge and you're in the middle of open water and it doesn't matter because you're just in your own little world there on that cruise ship, aren't you? We're not afraid of that anymore. But in those days, in those days, you basically could only go in the water as far as you could hold your breath. 
See how we take these things for granted in our world? I mean, in those days, especially the Romans. See, people out in the far east of the world, they had done better at ocean exploration and seafaring. They explored further away. But as we look at the Bible, and we'll see this here in just a few minutes, the Roman culture, they basically stuck to the coast. They didn't go far out. One of the reasons was that the Mediterranean was so hard to navigate, or it was to them. Their ships, Roman ships, the average Roman ship was only about 40 feet long. They just were not very good at seafaring. And so in the the Roman culture, in the first century, the idea of going way out into the ocean and exploring the depths of water and even some of their bigger seas like the Sea of Galilee, or even smaller, I should say, it was terrifying to them. They didn't live in the world of, of, of life vests and, and scuba gear and snorkels. and They lived in the world of, I can only go down as far as I can swim and hold my breath. What's under there? What's way down there? You know who the tough guys were? The tough guys, if you were a tough guy in Rome, the Roman culture, you were a fisherman. The rough and tumble guys were the brave ones that would spend their time out on that open water where we have no idea what's under there. That's why we get stories of sea monsters and all these other things going on in the culture because they just didn't know what was down there. We do. We have a much better idea. Actually, if, we, if we're honest, we don't even know what's down there. We've only explored just a very small fraction of our own oceans. But we know a whole lot more than they knew in Jesus' day. It's really interesting how history works. In our minds, you know, we read the times of the Bible and we connect with them so easily, but we're talking about 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago. Look how much culture has advanced just in our lifetimes. Now, we look at advancements because we look at, you know, when I was, when I was a kid, uh, a computer, I, I was the first age, I'm sort of like on that middle line between millennial and Gen X. So my borderline age is the last generation of people to remember what it was like to not have a computer in your house. So I'm right on that borderline age. I remember what that was like to not have a computer in your house. Our first computer was a word processor. Remember those? It was a brother word processor. And I can remember the internet was just kind of getting something that people were interested in. And uh, here we were uh, learning about this internet and our, our word processor could go online. Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo. But do you remember the early days of the internet? You'd go on there and you're like, okay, now what? If you didn't really know what you were doing with it, you, you really wouldn't uh, know how to use it. And we didn't. We went online with our word processor and we're like, okay, what's the big deal? But now we're living in a day where there's far, far more technology in your phone than were in computers in the 80s that were the size of a whole room. And that's just in the last 20 to 30 years, 40 years. And so we look at technological advancement and we take things for granted. And in th- it's not to say things weren't evolving in those days either. We, t- we believe sometimes that ancient cultures were, were primitive and they were stupid, but Uh, History and archaeology doesn't bear that idea out. They were very intelligent and they were advancing just like we are. And perhaps, perhaps we need cell phones because our brains need them. Maybe they didn't need all that information at their fingertips because they were just smarter than us. This idea that these people were just these primitive, you know, people that were were unintelligent, that kind of comes from an evolutionary worldview that we started off really simple living in caves and we've been evolving and becoming more intelligent. Well, maybe it's the other way around. Think about that one. So in the, in the Far East, they had been navigating the open seas much more, but the Romans were pretty poor sailors. They kept their trade routes quite close to the coast 
and they never explored very far out into the Mediterranean. Roman boats, as I said, were only usually about 40 feet long. 40 feet long, that's it. Compare that to our ocean liners now, our barges, right? So let's look a little bit at what Paul's uh, journey was, and it connects right along with this idea. So here's Paul, he's, he's being delivered to Rome, and he's a prisoner, but he's being treated pretty well, and uh, he has to journey to Rome, and this is the, the chapter that speaks of his shipwreck. But I want, to hear the, I want you to hear the language that he's speaking with, because it's this very same idea. They stick to the coast. They don't venture very far out. Uh, their seafaring is not good. Uh, Acts 27 and verse 1. Acts 27 and verse 1. And when it was decided that they should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius, and embarked in a ship at Adramentium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia. We put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. And putting out into the sea, we were, there we sailed under the lee of Cyprus, because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra of Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. Okay, see, so you see what's happening. They're only going little increments, one port at a time. You seeing this? Now, in our day, this is not very far. If you look at the geography of where they are, they're just going from one part of the Roman Empire to another part of the Roman Empire. They could just cut across the middle of the Mediterranean and you're there. But because they're afraid of the open water, they're sticking to the coast and going one port at a time because they're worried of what might happen if they just cut across. All right. What verse was I in? Remind me. Verse 6. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty in Snidus. And the wind did not allow us to go farther, so we sailed under the lee of Crete of Salmon. Coasting along it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which we was the city of Lacia. Verse 9, since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because of the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And it goes on to describe the shipwreck. They actually stay in a port... Uh, longer than they should have because they're afraid of the winds. He said it was after the fast. And that tells us that it was past the time of year that they felt comfortable sailing in the open water. But it wasn't even really open water because they're sticking to the coast. It was the time of year where the winds kick up in the Mediterranean and the Mediterranean was known to be very dangerous. And so they're worried about it. They haven't figured out a way to navigate the waters of the Mediterranean in high winds to get to their goal. As you continue to read the story, what actually happens is that they have to, the, the, they, they decide to, they, they stay in a port for a short time, and then they pause, and they're greedy. The ship captain and his, and the, the, the noblemen that are on board are greedy. They have a shipment of grain with them, and they want to get it to where it's supposed to go, so they push on at the wrong time of year, and that's what causes the shipwreck. Paul encouraged them to stay where they were. And what's interesting is you continue to read through Acts chapter 27, it actually teaches what they did when they, they knew they were going to wreck. Continue to read Acts chapter 27 uh, this, this afternoon when you go home, and it talks about how they anchored out in the open water or out offshore. Why would they anchor offshore? This was an ancient method of trying to preserve your boat. So when the storms were kicking up and the waves were tossing you left and right, you'd, there, there usually were four or five anchors on a ship like this. So the first thing they would do is they would throw the, drop the anchor offshore and hope that that anchor would hold. 
But when the rope broke to that anchor, they'd throw the next anchor down. But you know what's happening. They're being pushed closer and closer and closer to hazards or to shore where they would run aground or, or crash. So they drop the first anchor, it breaks. They drop the second anchor, it breaks. They drop the third anchor, it breaks. They drop the fourth anchor, it breaks. And they run into rocks and they crash. But just like God told Paul, no lives were lost. It's fascinating. They just were not good sailors. They didn't know what was under the water. They were afraid of the water. Do you remember the Greek god, not Roman now, but the Greek god of the waters? Do you remember who that was? Poseidon. That's exactly right. With the trident. It was Poseidon. Later, when the Romans took on the Greek religion, they renamed the Greek gods for the planets. So Poseidon became, does anybody know? Neptune, very good. You remember your history, another fellow history buff. Neptune, that's exactly right. Poseidon slash Neptune was known as bad-tempered, moody, and greedy. Now, let's think about that. He was the god of the seas, right? Well, the, it tells you what they thought about the sea. That the sea is what? Bad-tempered, moody, unpredictable, and greedy. It will take what you have if you don't please it or treat it right. That's what they thought of the sea. The perceived danger of the sea made fishing to be considered one of the most dangerous Roman jobs. The tough guys were fishermen because they're constantly out on that waters and we don't know what's under there. We don't know what's down there. So the tough guys were fishermen. And isn't it interesting that Jesus took many fishermen to be his disciples? Not that he needed tough guys. It's that I think he wanted to change the hearts and lives of tough guys. Maybe he needed their courage, though. So with this idea, it brings us to a passage of Scripture that people have asked me about time and time and time again. Revelation chapter 21, and this is where the mystery comes in. Revelation 21, maybe it's not so much of a mystery now as we thought it was before. I've, heard, I've had many, many people over the years ask me a question about this passage. Revelation 21, beginning in verse 1. Are you there? It's also on the screen. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. There was no more sea, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, from God. This is the new heavens and the new earth, the, the, the land that we're so longing for, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they will be His people, and God Himself will be with them as their God. Hallelujah! Looking forward to that day? But some of you are going, I love the ocean! I love to go to the beach. Are you telling me there's not going to be a beach or an ocean in heaven? I've had a lot of people ask me that question over the years. Is the Bible really saying that there's not going to be an ocean or a sea in heaven? Well, remember, the book of Revelation is symbolic, isn't it? It talks later in other places about the beasts coming up out of the sea or out of the waters. Well, the sea represents, if you're thinking of it historically, the sea represents chaos, unpredictability. The sea represents something to be feared. It's something to be afraid of. It's something that's unpredictable. Are you looking forward to a day and a time where there will be no longer something to be feared or unpredictable? Now that doesn't mean it won't be interesting. That doesn't mean we won't learn and grow in heaven. But I'm looking forward to a time where we don't have to worry about what, what might happen next. Constantly on guard, having our defenses up all the time. 
Aren't you longing for a day where it's just safety and security and happiness? No more unpredictability of this world having to put our defenses up all the time. No more sea. That's what John is talking about, or God is talking about through John. There's no more sea. Never wondering again what might be down there. What might be ahead? Seems like in this world, every time we get our lives going in the right direction, we get thrown another curveball. How about in heaven, no more curveballs? Ah. No more curveballs, no more stress. But that don't, doesn't mean it won't be interesting. There will be plenty of things to be interested in. There will be plenty of things to learn. There will be plenty of things to encounter and understand and learn about and and adventure through and and discover. But that doesn't mean we're going to have that mean, but we won't have to deal with constant curveballs. Go with me to Matthew chapter 14. Because now that we have this understanding of what the sea represented to first century people, Matthew chapter 14 and verse 22, we get a little better understanding of what's happening here. Very famous story in in the Gospels. Matthew chapter 14 and verse 22, it says, this is is speaking of Jesus after he feeds the 5,000, it says, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Well, he dismissed the crowds, and after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When the evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. Oh, here it is again. The unpredictable sea, the greedy, moody sea. The waves are beating against it, the wind. In the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, verse 25, and he was walking on the what? The sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, what? It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. Now, does this mean that the disciples, you know, believed in ghosts? No, it didn't mean they believed in ghosts. What it means is that they were terrified of the sea. And the sea is tossing them and turning them and and it's it's creating all sorts of chaos. And these were seafarers. They were fishermen. But they're terrified for their lives because now the, the sea god or whatever is about to kill them. Maybe, and they see, what? What is that? It's 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 something moving on top of the water. And it gets closer and it looks like a person. How is a person walking on top of the storm? And their minds go through the stuff that they've heard around them from the Greeks and Romans and everybody else who are terrified of the water. Well, it must be one of these spirits from the water we keep hearing about. That's the only explanation for it, isn't it? It must be... What these Greeks and Romans have been saying is this is waters, the spirits, it's something. And then he gets closer. You see, the disciples never in their wildest dreams ever thought Jesus would be what he was. They had just been told that he would be this man who would deliver them under the hand from the hand of the Romans, from the authority of the Romans. And would lift them up to prominence in the world. They never expected a man to be able to walk on top of the storm. To walk on top of the sea. But now you see the message, don't you? It's a powerful message. One of the most feared things in the entire world was the open deep water to the disciples. Even though they were fishermen, one of the things that they feared the most was the deep open water. And the water now is churning and the storm is raging and the waves are flying over their heads and the boat's taking on water. And all of a sudden, there is Jesus walking on top of their greatest fear. He is 
standing with authority on top of their greatest fear. Friends, what is your greatest fear? There's Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords, standing with authority, and he's put that fear under his feet. Do you believe that today? That's why he says, don't be afraid. It is I. Don't be afraid. The story goes on. And Peter answered him, Lord, if, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And, and he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he, when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? What's he doubting? Think about it, just in simple terms, what's he doubting? Whether Jesus truly is in charge of the sea. Is Jesus really more powerful than my greatest fear? Is he really more present and more glorious and more, more powerful? And does he really have authority to keep my feet on top of what I fear the most? And as soon as that doubt enters in his mind, he sinks. But here's the good news for us. Sometimes our fears will get the best of us, don't, won't they? Here's the message. The one who walks on the sea will be right there to pick us up out of our greatest fears. Amen. And he will pull us to safety and put us in the boat. He said, don't be afraid. Why'd you doubt, Peter? You could have stayed on top of the water. And here's the wonderful thing. We don't have to fall in. We don't have to live with fear. We don't have to live with doubt. We don't have to live thinking, oh no, I may sink at any moment. That's the accuser after us. That's, that's believing and trusting in our own power and in our own strength. That's why I believe the, uh, one of the other gospel writers, when recording this story, says that Peter looked back at his peers. He looked back at his peers. He began to believe and began to doubt. And he, he began to trust in his own strength. And when we trust in our own strength, we can't walk on the sea. We're going to sink. And so the other gospel writer puts that detail in there because he wants us to know when you realize that Jesus is king of the sea. You cannot fall in. But when you begin to trust in your own faith and in your own strength or worry the next time you might fall in, you may doubt, you may wonder, Lord, do you really have this? Are you really king of kings? Are you really the king of me? We'll sink. Here's the good news. A righteous man may fall down, but what does he do? He gets back up. The Bible doesn't say a righteous man never falls down. The Bible doesn't say a righteous man never falls in the drink. It says the righteous man, when he does fall down, he gets up and he gets up and he gets up and he gets up. And we don't get up in our own strength. We're flailing. Do you ever feel like you're flailing in fear? you ever feel like you're flailing in anxiety and under stress? You're under the water and you're wondering, are you ever going to take another breath? There comes the hand of Jesus to grab us by the wrist and pull us out. And it happens every time. Can anybody testify to that today? It happens every time. But the devil says, not this time. It's not going to happen this time. He's not going to pull you up this time. Now he doesn't care. You failed him too much. You've been too great a sitter and he's turned his back on you. He's walking off and trying to rescue somebody else. Or he's lost his power. Or that was all a lie before. You thought it was him all along. Oh no, that was a lie. He's not really there. That's what the devil tries to get us to believe. But in those moments, then we need to stop again and look out on the horizon. Because what we will see every single time, someone's walking on the sea. And he's getting closer and closer and closer. And don't say, it's a ghost, because you know who it is. 
Jesus is king of the sea. He's king of the storm. He's king of the fears. He's king of our anxieties. He's king over our stresses. He's walking on top of them. He's conquered them and we need not drown. There's another story very similar to this one in Mark chapter 4 where Jesus is napping in the boat during another storm. You remember that story, I'm sure. The boat's taking on water, and the interesting thing about this one is that it was, the time, it was not the time of year where storms usually rise up. It's on the Sea of Galilee, and if you look at the geography of the Sea of Galilee, it's in a valley. So many storms don't make it over the mountains or the hills by the Sea of Galilee, but occasionally, or actually often in certain times of year, the storms actually do make it over the hills, and when they do, they come down into that valley, and it's like, it's like taking buckets of water and dumping them into a bathtub. So the water, the water comes in, the storm comes in, and the water just turns over like this. It, they're, they're raging. They're, they, you can see why people were so terrified. They're out there in their little wooden boat, and the, the whole Sea of Galilee is doing this. They're like they're in a washing machine. And so Jesus is sleeping through the storm. Because he knows he's the king of the storm. He doesn't have to worry about this storm. But the disciples don't know that. They don't know what he's all about. And so they wake him up. Jesus, Jesus, don't you care that we're going to drown? And he gets up and he reaches out his hand. Even though... He's already king of the sea. He can be king with the storm raging, or he can be king when the, when the sea is calm. Do you believe that? He doesn't change. He's always king. He reaches out his hand to the storm, and he says, shh. That word for peace literally is shh. Shh. Be still. And immediately the water's calm. And that's why the disciples respond with what they say. Remember what they say? They look at each other and they go, Who is this guy? Who is this guy? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Who is this guy? They couldn't figure it out because they never expected the Messiah to be that. All they'd ever heard is that there's gods of the deep open water, that there's gods to be feared. We don't know what's under there. There might be monsters under there. It, it may be that there's really no bottom to the sea. It may just keep going. We don't know. They, they didn't know what was under there. And here the storm is about to take their lives... And he stands up and he says, shh, be still. And the water's calm and they say, is, is he Neptune? Is he Jup? Who, who is he? No, he's Jesus, the creator of the sea, the king of you and me, the one who will never let us drown. And this world tells us the same things. There are things too great. There are things too complicated. There are things that are too hard, too stressful, too full of turmoil. We don't know what's going to happen to us tomorrow. We don't know what's around the next corner. We don't know what we're going to experience. It's too unpredictable. Faith is useless. That's what it tells us. And we say, no, nope, I've seen it too many times where Jesus has come walking on the storm to me. I've seen it too many times to not believe that it's going to happen this time. Jesus tramples on the gods of chaos and the unknown. Can you say amen? All the evil and the unpredictable in this world is nothing compared to him. In that day, in the first century, it was the sea. It was what was the most terrifying, unpredictable, mysterious, crazy thing in the world. But today, what is your most terrifying, unpredictable, mysterious, crazy thing in your world? 
Even in it, he's there he is, walking steadily towards you. It does not affect him. Your circumstances do not affect his kingly power and authority. What I mean by that is you think your world is falling apart at the seams. But the creator, redeemer, sustainer, the king of kings and lord of lords never changes. We get worried every time there's an election. Elections don't make God nervous. Oh no, what's going to happen? The Lord's like, it's four years. <laughs> and four years to him is 30 seconds. It's nothing to him. We get worried about the things in our world. We get worried about gas prices. We get worried about politics. We get worried about wars. We get worried about our, our, how we're going to pay our own bills. We get worried. We get worried. We get worried. And that worry builds up. And that stress builds up. And it feels like we're going to drown in it. And the Lord says, hold on. Shh. Be still. I'm still here. And I'm walking above the storms of this life. They do not affect him. The sea may churn, the skies may darken, the gods of this world may rage, but he is still King of kings and Lord of lords. He doesn't change, he doesn't waver, and he does not fail. You might be thinking, well then why all this suffering if he's King of kings and Lord of lords? You know why? Because he's waiting for you and me to finally see him standing right there saying, do you really like these stormy seas? Is this what you want? In the end, that's what the judgment is all about. Do you like the stormy seas of death or do you want to live? And at the end, he simply gives what we ask for. Life or death. The troubles and trials of this world rage all around us and God is allowing it to play out so that we will see it and go, this can't be all there is. This is not what I want. And we'll look to him walking on that water and say, there he is. That's what I want. There's one last piece to this. Go with me to Revelation chapter 4 as we begin to close here. Revelation chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Revelation 4, 1. Because the book of Revelation isn't done with mentioning the sea. So remember, before in the new heavens and the new earth, it's referring to the worldly seas. Remember, the, the first earth, this earth's seas. There's another sea at the throne of God. Revelation 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what may, must take place after this. At the throne, I, at once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, and one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had an appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Go down to verse 6. It says, And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass. Remember the earthly seas. What was the problem with the earthly seas? I can't see what's down there. I don't know what's down there. Isn't that the problem with our world? We don't know what's coming next. We don't know what monster is going to come out of the depths at us next in this sinful world. Isn't that true? But before the throne of God, it's a sea that's clear. The foundation under my feet or the thing that I find myself in, there is no depth that I have to worry about what might happen to me next because He has the world, the universe, in His hand. To the first century Christian, they're looking at that and going, a sea of glass? That means I could see all the way to the bottom. I can only see a few feet down and I don't know what's down there. I might get swallowed up by some monster. That's our world, isn't it? 
I don't know what's ahead of me. I don't know what's going to happen to me when I walk out of here. And it, fear and, and, and stress are constantly around us. But in front of the throne of God, we can see all the way to the bottom and we have nothing to fear. Because all authority and power is in His hands. And then in Revelation chapter 15, we get another little detail. And I love this one. It's powerful. I think you're going to love it too. Revelation chapter 15 and verse 2. Revelation chapter 15 and verse 2. And I saw what happened to be a sea of glass mingled with what? Fire. And also those who conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. We're going to read that here in just a second, but I want you to notice what's happened. You see that on this sea of glass is mingled with fire. Fire is always a symbol of what in Scripture? The holiness, righteousness, and judgment of God. Isn't that true? Now I want you to think about this picture. The sea of glass is completely transparent. And it's mingled with the fire of God which represents His judgment. What is it telling us? The judgment of God is completely transparent. Think about how meaningful that is for you and me. He's not arbitrary. In Him all the questions are answered. We don't have to wonder why he's made the decisions that he's made. And it says that, that, the, that the, the saints, those who have overcome, are standing beside the sea of glass. The transparent sea of glass mingled with the judgment of God. It's see-through. The judgment of God is see-through. We can understand why he has made the determinations that he's made and the judgments that he's made. This world is full of arbitrary leaders who are in it for themselves and their own selfish motives. This world is set up on it. We don't know why things happen to us. We don't know why someone did what they did. In heaven, there will be no more conspiracies. In heaven, there will be no more backhanded gossip or judgments. In heaven, God's judgments are completely transparent. He will make known why He has made the decisions that He has made for everyone to know, and we will say to Him, you are righteous and holy and good, for your judgments are just and true. And that's what the song of Moses is. It goes on in verse 3, and they sing the song of Moses, the saints, after the great tribulation, and Jesus comes, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God Almighty, just just. And true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been, what? Revealed. The fire, the righteousness, the judgment of God on the crystal clear sea of glass. God is saying, I'm an open book. I will not make any decisions. My will will be completely known to everyone. And we will stand there and say, yes, it's true, and you really are good. His judgment is totally transparent. There are no conspiracies in Jesus. There is no more fear of the unknown. There are no limits to where we can go. No more wondering what's under this. No more wondering what's behind this. Talk about heaven. His will will be known. His righteousness will be known. And we will no longer fear the sea. The sea of this world. I want to make a special prayer today. Because I know this world, we've been tossed and turned lately. If there's somebody here today that feels like the storm has been raging all around you and you've been having a hard time finding Jesus walking on the water, and today you need to see him clearly in the storm. I want to say a special prayer for you. If you need to be reminded that he's still king of kings, 
even in your trial or your tribulation, your questioning or what's happening in your life or what's behind the scenes or what's going on, you need to, you need to be reminded that he is walking on the seas of despair and worry and stress. If you need to find peace by seeing Jesus walking on the storm, would you join me in the front right now because I want to pray for you? Do you need to see Jesus clearly amidst the waves and the storms and the tumult of this world where there's so many questions? There's so many trials. We don't know what's behind the next door. And you need to say, I need to see Jesus walking on my storm. And I need to be reminded that there is no storm where he can't reach out his hand and say, shh, be still. This prayer is for you. Amen. Father in heaven, we come to you today because, Lord, we felt tossed and turned. We feel like the disciples in that ship with the sea of fear underneath us. We don't know what's coming with the next wave. We don't know what's coming with the next trial, the next tribulation, and we're scared, Lord. We're scared. We know we need to walk on the, on the water with you, but Lord, we're terrified because it seems like every time we step out of the boat, we fall in. We feel like we're drowning sometimes, God. And so, Lord, today, help us to look out to the horizon. Help us to see there you are walking on my storm, standing on the sea of my fear, trampling down the gods of this world. There you are, and you don't change. And if for some reason we do fall in, you are right there to grab us and pull us out. Lord, we need you today. We're pleading for you today. Lord, bless each person that's standing here and those that maybe couldn't come forward. Lord, this world wants to drown us. The gods of this world, the accuser, wants to drown us. But Lord, you are standing on that sea with great power and great authority. And we are asking you as our King, as our Lord, we're asking you to say, shh, be still. Give us that peace today, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. The good news is the storms rage around us and the storm clouds sometimes block out our sun. But we know that Jesus is the true light, amen? amen. And we know because of him, the clouds will not always cover that, that sun. The clouds will part and a new day will dawn. Do you believe that today? And for us, Today, we've prayed this prayer, we're expecting a new day. And so with that hope and with that great joy, I'm going to invite you to stand with me and we're going to sing a happy song because it's a new day where our Savior is walking on the sea of our fears and He is conquered. And we're going to sing, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let's stand together and sing.